position of the Kingdom War Room. Uh, the purpose of the Kingdom War Room is we get very strategic and the guests that we have on because it needs to be things that the body of Christ needs to be dealing with right now, not only in America, but around the world. And today, uh, Mike and I are fortunate enough to have Joe Dallas on. Joe Dallas is an author. He's a conference speaker. He is a uh, pastoral counselor. And I almost want to stop right there because, guys, what you're going to see in the topic that we're dealing with today, that as we jump into it, Joe's going to come from a counselor perspective. Mike Spaulding's going to come from a pastoral perspective. I'm going to come from a theologian's perspective, as well as a tactician in the kingdom of God. And so we're going to we're going to be hitting this, I think, from three different uh, avenues. Uh, it is something real. It's something that's happening across America. Now, Joe has written nine books on, on human sexuality. A few of them are Desires in Conflict, uh, The Game Plan, When Homosexuality Hits Home, uh, Five Steps to Breaking Free from Porn. Boy, does the church need that one right now. It's, it's out of control from what I understand. Uh, in, in many corners of the body of Christ. His latest one that's on point is Christians in a Cancel Culture. Now, Joe has, he's no stranger to media. In fact, uh, you know, I, I, I read, uh, in fact, we're going to have all this online so that you can read over it. He's been on a Focus with the Family and the Bible Answer Man, but he's also survived shows like Joan River and ABC News, and, <laughs> and for that we should, we should give him a medal. Uh, and, uh, when you when you look at the ad copy for today's show, we're going to have a link so that everybody can simply go directly to Amazon and get his book in either Kindle or in paperback format. And Joe, thank you for being on the show today. Uh, we in America, we find ourselves in the middle of a Marxist revolution. And one aspect of that Marxist revolution is this weird thing that we're seeing across the United States call it, called being called cancel culture and Christians are finding themselves right in the right in the crosshairs of this movement aren't they they are Michael I I really feel like we're in the midst of a crusade um a cancel culture basically is a crusade to convert the infidels we who hold a biblically based worldview are the infidels who need to be converted and if we will not be converted then we need to be silenced and I think we are facing a relatively new position in America in that the church and the culture have traditionally been on fairly friendly terms. At one time, we were even largely in agreement. If you can imagine, there was such a time um, in a faraway galaxy. But what we're finding now is not only the need to know the truth and to express the truth, but we are also being called on like never before, to defend the truth, to defend our right to hold to the truth, and to defend the validity of the truths we hold. So Christians in a Cancel Culture um, was written with the idea of equipping the average believer to have the kind of dialogues we're having because of the situation you just described. We are in the middle of a revolution. A part of that revolution is a crusade to convert the infidels and folks. That's us. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think uh, the Laodicean era that we have had in the church has disarmed a lot of believers. Uh, I was recently on a show, on Alan Key's show, and he had a guest pastor on that day. And we began talking about a phenomenon in church that if you question somebody's belief or ask them to define their soundbite, your, your, your response is hostility from the church. Mm -hmm. And what that has done, that has crippled us, that if we can't sit down with a brother and show why we believe what we believe when 99% of what we believe is true, and a lot of times I'll question somebody's theological soundbite to see if there's anything beyond the veneer. Yeah. And so they, the, the what I call the priest of the darkness, if you will, has in the background neutered the church. And they, the communists uh, infected a lot of our seminaries as far back as 1920 here in America. Of yep. course, that, that came over into, into the church, into the pew. And so now our beliefs are being challenged, and we're, we're basically intellectually and spiritually coming to the battlefield unarmed. 
Michael, I think you're bringing up an important point here. It, it seems to me that the biggest problem is not the opposition we face from without, but the weakness we experience from within, you know? Um, I was unfortunately a, a very actively involved in homosexuality back in the late 70s and early 80s. And when I was, that was right at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. So I learned a lot about what AIDS can do to a body because I saw so many of my friends die. And uh, one of the terrible things about that is that when someone's body is infected with the AIDS virus, their immune system is so compromised that the diseases that normally would not affect them will now kill them. Yeah. Now, I really believe that the body of Christ in that sense has uh, a compromised immune system. When we are biblically grounded and we have biblical discernment, our immune system is, is pretty much intact. So the different heresies or falsehoods that normally would not affect the body, they're not gonna penetrate a good immune system. But if the immune system is compromised, if we're biblically ignorant, which much of the church is, if we thereby lack biblical discernment, then you know what? We're susceptible now to a lot of diseases that otherwise would not impact us, but the problem started from within with that infection. Yes, yes, ab absolutely. And what's what's exacerbated that, I think, Joe and and uh, Mike, is that prior to the the emergence just the the full-blown manifestation of this strategy i'll call it a, the strategy of our enemy prior to that there was a there was a uh, steady decrease in the number of people who were actually sharing their faith and and now because of the climate of fear and and uh, hostility toward the message there's even fewer that are willing to step to the forefront, stand in the gaps, share. Even though the scripture, our assignment hasn't changed, we right. are to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. And yet the church is ill-equipped today for the exact reasons, Mike, that you mentioned and Joe, you elaborated on. I, I think that's largely the case, Mike. And, and Michael, like you were saying, we're we're basically showing up for a battle we're not prepared for. Yeah. No, and I, I mean you're you're not going to play a good game of football if you don't have any of the padding on and you don't know the plays. You you cannot train believers one day a week when they only let you speak for 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> and uh, I know uh, when I teach it's anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes. You know I'm um, I'm I'm called a, a I call myself a Baptocostal with a good for a swirl of Hebraic heritage. But I remember when I thought my my uh, calling a guy was to fill up that 90 minute cassette tape every time I taught, you know. <laughs> and, you, you would be your Tychus worst nightmare. <laughs> oh, and, uh, all right, now we're getting ready to, uh, to record Understanding the Kingdom Part 100. Yeah. Uh, because we, we, we have sugar-coated everything, we've reduced it down to sound bites, to where the, the believer does not have the depth. And I, I think one of the quandaries uh, is, you know, right on, on the computer that we're recording this with, I have almost 30,000 volumes of theological Bibles, you know, all this stuff that I can within an instant research and dig just as deep in. But biblical illiteracy, has I don't think, has ever been so high, except maybe at the beginning of the Reformation. Yeah. yeah, and you, you know, I, I think, Michael, that accounts for a lot of the trouble we're facing. And what to me is so tragic about all of this is nobody is saying that all believers need to be scholars. You know, right. I don't right. believe every believer is called to be an expert theologian or a professional apologist, but for heaven's sake, we can read. Yes. I mean, when I was first born again in 1971, sitting under the ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith in Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, we were all taught, we all took it as Christianity 101, that you read your Bible, you daily read your Bible. Now, if you read the Bible through and you are consistently reading the Bible, you know what it says. That doesn't mean you have to have a PhD. But anybody can read this document, anybody can learn this document, and thereby anybody can be well equipped to discern truth from error. 
That's all we're calling on people to do. We're not calling on anything extraordinary that's beyond the average person's capacity here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do think that a pastor should be a theologian. Uh, in fact, I mean, there's books penned on that. And I think one of the reasons that where we're in the shape that we're in is we have so many pastors simply regurgitate whatever is popular on Christian television. And that's where a lot of this heresy and sound bites and different things have really taken hold. Instead of like Judson Cornwell said, they need to go up to the mountain and have that fiery, you know, that fiery bush experience so they can yeah. be from the presence of God with a message. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so I, I think it's on both sides. Now, one of the things, brothers, that I'm hearing, uh, I'm, I'm hearing because I've been training aspirants at the gospel ministry now for almost 40 years. And it used to be they were moaning at the place that they have basically put them in a box of 20 minutes. Okay. And it just grieved them. Uh, I've had pastors calling me in tears saying, my church says you can have an hour, you can have an hour and a half, whatever you need, because we're realizing we have been starving to death on cotton candy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that, well, like, you know, again, this to reverse this curve. Exactly. And Michael, again, I, I can't help but think, I, I know you should not always be going back to the good old days, but when I was first born again, my church, Calvary Chapel, was a church full of former hippies. I mean, we were a bunch of scruffy kids, not from disciplined backgrounds at all, but we would sit on our tails for an hour to an hour and a half easily listening to Chuck Smith expound on the scripture. No problem. OK, yep. so it wasn't military school. It wasn't rocket science. We were simply hungry for the word of God. And I think that we may be seriously underestimating within the average person the hunger people have to know. Has God spoken? If so, what has he said? People are very hungry yes. for the word. Yes. Amen. Amen. One of the one of the things. Uh, brothers that I think we need to call people's attention to you understand it. Uh, Joe, you wrote the book. Mike, you understand it as a as a theologian. Pastors and ministry leaders need to communicate this to to the to the sheep that have been placed under their watch care. And that is this: we've been hoodwinked by a Trojan horse of sorts, if we can use that illustration. I know that it gets worn out sometimes, but this Trojan horse that has invaded the church. Uh, in disguise is tolerance, the whole concept of tolerance. And, and what that means today, we've been moved from a, from a place where the battle was for truth to a place, and you mentioned this, Joe, in the very opening uh, comments that you had for our, our conversation. We've, we've left the place where the battle was for truth, and now we find ourselves in a place where we're battling for the right to speak the truth. And that exactly. has come about, that, that paradigm shift, because of tolerance. So tolerance is really a Trojan horse. It is a lie, and it is not really what people claim that it is, is it? No. In fact, Mike, it's become clear that what people wanted when they called for tolerance was not tolerance at all. It was uniformity. Yeah. I remember just a few years ago, those cute little bumper stickers that said coexist with the signs of different religions and worldviews. Well, on the one hand, yes, I am all for peaceful coexistence. I mean, I take Paul at his word when he said as much as is possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all people. Sure. Um, but when people were asking for tolerance, they were asking for more than that. They were saying, I would like my voice to find an audience within your church. I would like my voice to find an audience in your living room. I want you to open up your realm of influence to my influence so that I can speak to the people under your care. And uh, as a result, once the people got a foothold in our living rooms, in our schools, in even our churches, one of the first orders of business they had was get rid of the Bible believing Christians, get rid of the conservative Christian voice, get rid of the plain respect for biblical authority. And so, of course, what we're seeing now is uh, oh, there was a movie that came out about 30 years ago called While You Were Sleeping. I think that's a pretty good title for today. While you were sleeping, something happened. And what happened was it's not just that error got a foothold, error also 
turned into a drill sergeant demanding all of us obey. So this is something a far cry from tolerance. I believe now that that was never really the goal. It was just the stated goal. Yes, amen. So the so, justifies the means so you can lie through your teeth about what you're wanting to do. And you know, we can even go back to the, when you understand that Marxism uh, is a mind virus, you go back to your AIDS situation. The first thing it tries yeah. to do is neutralize the immune system. And right now, what we're in the middle of is a raging fever to where the virus is trying to take over. Yeah. And really, it's it's um, terrifying and fascinating at the same time, because people who you thought you knew are suddenly morphing in the way they approach truth and even in the way they approach you. I mean, guys, as we speak, there are Christian parents who have sons or daughters come home from university and say, mom, dad, have you repented of your racism yet? Have you repented of your homophobia yet? I identify as something other than what you thought I was. I am no longer a male, I am a female. And if you will not agree with that identification, I won't have anything to do with you. And and one of the, the things parents are asking is, where did you ever pick up those ideas? And the other is, why do I suddenly mean so little to you that you are willing to throw our relationship away for the sake of this ideology you've latched onto? I mean, people hold to this with an absolute fervor. Mm -hmm. One of the few, very few things I can say I admire about this new movement is, boy, are they wrong? But I'll tell you this, they sure are fervent. I, I mean, I, I wish that uh, believers were as fervent for the truth as so many people now are about error. Yes, yes, amen. But one of the one of the illustrations you use, Joe, in in your book, I believe it's chapter four. You talk about you've been starred, you've yeah. been starred, and and the idea behind that really is uh, is misinformation, which is a big subject today. Um, but mis mischaracterization, I, I think, is is a good way to describe it. And because Christians don't really know what the scripture says and who they are in Christ, they've become easy targets for this cancel culture, haven't they? I, I think they have, Mike. I'm reminded of the 1970s when Norman Lear produced a TV show called All in the Family. And uh, the, the, the key figure in that show was Archie Bunker, who was really a jerk. I mean, the, the, the guy was oafish and rude to his wife and bossy and unreasonable and, and not very smart. And uh, he was a social conservative. <laughs> so Norman Lear successfully foisted the idea on the American public that that's a social conservative. Mm -hmm. Archie Bunker. Yeah. Well, who wants to be associated with that? Now, social conservatives, well, I guess like Christians, there are Christians who are Christian in the sense that they believe the basics, but they haven't really studied the basics, they haven't examined the basics, they're not well grounded. So when they get challenged, they get shaky. There were social conservatives who sort of conveniently adopted conservatism, but weren't quite sure why they believed what they believed. They were the first ones to go, hey, I don't wanna be associated with Archie Bunker, therefore I'm either gonna shut my mouth up as a conservative and stay silent so nobody thinks I'm one of those, or I'm going to reject conservatism entirely because Archie Bunker's a jerk and I don't want to be a jerk. Now, the same thing is being done to Christians today. People are presenting to the culture the image of the Bible-believing Christian as being misogynistic, racist, homophobic, transphobic, nationalistic, completely unreasonable. Christians who are not well-grounded look at that and go, I don't want to be that, so I either reject the faith altogether or I adopt a revised faith faith which is more user friendly mm -hmm. and and this is what i think is sort of either intimidation by association or even conversion by association because people are people believe the negative press the world is putting out about the the biblically based believer and wanting to shy away from that rather than accept i, I think something simple that the it used to be christianity 101 all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Somewhere along the line, I think many believers came to think that if we're not getting along well with the world, we must be doing something wrong. 
or if people think negative things about us, there must be something wrong, which is why I was discouraged when that book um, called Unchristian came out and it described how many people negatively view the church. Well, I understand and I can appreciate how people might have wanted to help us understand the way the world sees us, but the conclusions many people drew were, went something like this. Oh, if the culture thinks we're bad people, we must be doing something wrong, therefore let's change our position. Now, I am all for admitting sometimes we do the right thing in the wrong way. I look at the way I have sometimes presented the gospel. I look at some of the stupid, insensitive, aggressive things I've done, and I just, I want to shoot myself when I think of it, okay? So I get it. We could use some self-examination, fine. But that doesn't mean we, we uh, reverse our position. It means we improve the way we express our position. We don't touch the position itself today. We're touching the position. We're basically removing ancient landmarks that are mm -hmm. not supposed to be removed. Yes. You know, one of the characteristics of, of this younger generation that I've noticed, and I've got one of my own kids that are this way, that, you know, they, they watch, let's say, MSNBC. And not only are they uh, convinced of their position, but there is there is no logic to it but they're absolutely convinced that there is no other opinion but them as well as an attitude that they will warp the universe to adhere to their position i i have never seen that in a generation before uh, you know the last one of the last chapters of my book is called an orgy of virtue and i think that's largely what's happening with a lot of folks i, I would have to say especially in the the woke mindset um there is something intoxicating, isn't there, about being right, about congratulating yourself for being right, about being self-righteous, about seeing yourself as on a, a kind of a moral high horse. And if you are, for whatever reason, convinced that you are in that camp, you are among the, the people who have the right to tell the rest of the world what they should do, what they should think, and especially the right to overturn centuries of theological thought and tradition. Um, if you see yourself as the new moral crusader, that can alone can be so intoxicating that you don't want to examine yourself to determine whether or not your cause is right. Now, in fairness, I think there is something God-given that, that drives people to want to be a part of something good. And I see nothing wrong with that. I see nothing wrong, especially with young people, being idealistic. I think idealism should come uh, with being young. Good for them. But uh, unfortunately, if that idealism is combined with intellectual laziness, then what's going to happen is people will jump on a moral bandwagon without examining the claims of the bandwagon. And this is why I think a lot of young people have latched on to the idea that the basic tenets of cancel culture are true that people who hold traditional conservative views should be silenced, even should be punished. Because if you tell people that there are victims to protect and tyrants to fight, then people will jump on that and say, let's fight the tyrants. Now, we have been identified as the tyrants. And a lot of people are so anxious to fight tyrants, they are not taking the time to examine who really is and who is not a tyrant. And this is what cracks me up about the times we're in, guys. We, we get beaten up, and the people who beat us up then turn around and say, did you see how those guys just beat me up? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm the one that's bleeding here, and I'm the oppressor? Yeah, that's exactly the way it is. So I've often said, because I live in California, we've all sat down at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. That's what it feels like. And one one of the things I have seen over God, I love studying history and and I love studying how the mystery religions have worked. I mean, the ever since Nimrod, uh, society has been a petri dish that they're constantly experimenting on mm -hmm. ways of controlling society. And going back to Germany, what was theirs that you you have to have a them and you have to have an us. And we're outraged because of what they have done, even though it's illogical, 
it's, it's the same thing over and over again. Now, during World War II, it was the Jews. You know, the Jews run the world, the Jews control all the money, what, whatever, and so they, we, we need to have that solution to them. The exact same ideology that the, that the elite developed during World War II has been used successfully. They used it in China. They're now using it in America because the only real threat that they have is the body of Christ in America. And it's always been that way. It was the threat in China because when Christians are really living their faith, we can produce what communism only promises. Yeah. Well, I've often said if I hated humanity as Satan hates humanity, I would do exactly what he's doing. I would influence those who can be influenced to reject the very things that could set them free. In fact, Mike, you pointed out the the concept of being starred. I think that fits right along with this because I, I, I thought what was brilliant, evil but brilliant, about the Hitler propaganda machine was that it made the Jews out to be both despicable and powerful simultaneously. If people are just really dirty and weird and, and despicable, that doesn't inflame as much hatred as, as it does if you also say, and they are powerful. They run the banks. They've run the government. They've had all this control and all of this privilege. It's easy to knock down somebody if you've seen them as a bully. And I think that this is the way Christians today are being, quote unquote, starred. When people reacted, I believe, to the yellow star, they reacted not to what Jewish people were, but to the way Jewish people were represented by that star. The star yeah. represented the stereotype of the Jewish person. The yes. term, um, what, uh, uh, homophobe, transphobe, religious right, that refers to the image that the culture is trying to get people, the cultural elites are trying to get people to believe of us. And, and thereby, when people react to us, when people want to pass laws banning what we say or what we practice or try to restrict freedom of speech and freedom of religion, well, if you can discredit people to the point where they appear so loathsome, then the public's not going to be very excited about it when you take away those people's rights. And I think that this is one of the reasons there is such a crusade to convince the culture surrounding us that we are dangerous, hateful people so that when the elites in that culture start trying to strip us of basic freedoms like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, the culture will be largely indifferent to that because we're such awful people anyway. Who cares what happens to us? It's mm -hmm. pretty clever. Yeah, yeah, it really is, Joe. And, and for those who've joined us today, I, I want to remind you we are speaking with uh, author Joe Dallas. The book is Christians in a Cancel Culture, Speaking with Truth and Grace, in a hostile world. Joe's website is joedallas.com. joedallas.com, you can go there and get the book. One of the things that I like about your book, Joe, is that it is actually uh, an equipping kind of book. I, I, would, I would categorize it as a discipleship kind of book, and this is why, this is why, on, on this subject, because the, the format and the layout of your book lends itself very well to group Bible studies, and uh, so you have a, uh, you discuss the subject, then you have a section, keep in mind, where, where you list key points under that subject and in that chapter. And then, and then you have a section you call keep it biblical. That, that is valuable right there because it's, listen, Christians are just as susceptible to allowing emotions to take us off the tracks and, and distract us yeah. from the key points that we wanna keep in mind. And, and then finally, keep it going. You have a section called keep it going, how to answer common questions, objectives, or misunderstandings. The layout is brilliant, and so I commend you for that and, and encourage folks to get the book, joedallas.com, and just like to have your comments on that, Joe. Well, I, I appreciate that. It's very encouraging to hear that because that's exactly what I wanted it to be. Look, Guys, I think that most Bible-believing Christians know where they stand. The question becomes how to stand. Yes. What do I say? What yes. words do I use? What phrases do I avoid? What sort of opportunity do I look for? See, that's That's been the issue. I don't think people needed me to write a book saying, 
this is what you should believe about abortion. I, you know, although I, I think there are, there's a lot of confusion about that, but I think most Bible believing Christians have a very clear position on that. The question becomes how and when do I speak and what do I say? And that's true also of homosexuality, transgender, the whole racial issue. What is racism? Am I guilty of it? Am I not? How do I speak to someone who thinks I am just because I don't adopt their definition of racism? And progressive Christianity, what is it? How do I respond to it? So my hope was, was to put together something that would equip the average believer in very simple terms. I have friends who are theologians, and as Michael said, we need more of them. Um, and they've written brilliant books. Um, I am more the truck driver down the street who wrote a book for just average people in very plain everyday language to help them better understand when you're sitting around the dinner table, when you're at, at when you're on work break at your office, when you're talking to fellow students or friends or family members, when this comes up, here are a few ideas on what to say. And hopefully here's a way to better understand why there is so much hostility coming at you for the viewpoints you hold. Because as I tried to say in the book, I don't believe just saying, I love Jesus is gonna get you in a lot of hot water. But if you are faithful to his teachings, watch out, it's gonna get scalding hot. And I think that that's the point. Um, people are thinking that, that uh, just being a believer is what's getting people persecuted. Well, in the strictest sense it is, because if you're a believer, you hold fidelity to the truth. But it's speaking the truths that, that caused the controversy. And uh, I, I think that that's why more than ever we're needing to be equipped for that controversy, because these are truths we cannot back down on. I do understand there are some things we can go, eh, agree to disagree. I'm not gonna break fellowship with somebody over when the rapture is gonna happen. I've got my own position, I'm very settled on it, that's fine. But I don't see that as an essential that we have to break fellowship over. But the definition of marriage and family, the definition of normal sexuality, the definition of biblical justice and salvation itself, we cannot compromise these in our churches and in our homes and our lives, we can't. These are hills to die on. So. If nothing else, I hope I could write a book to help people die well. If we have to go down, I want to go down with honor, you know? Amen. You know, one of the things I'm hoping for, you know, the 1960s was a, was the Satanic Rebels. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was, it was an yeah. occult, it was an occult explosion. And the second wave of that has been in the late uh, 2000s. That this is, this is a part of the wave of that. Now, you said, you know, you were a part of Chuck Smith's ministry, which I absolutely loved. And, you know, I, I view that era as a time that Satan so pushed people so far away from God, he pushed them into God. Yes. And I have really been in prayer. You know, if the church will do its job, if we'll dig deep and get established in our faith so that we can give a reason for the hope that is within us. And, and really do our due diligence, we can see God once again co create an off-ramp off of this back into the kingdom of God for all these people. Mm -hmm. Michael, I, I have thought of that very thing so many times. Chuck would have agreed with you. He often said that the excesses of the hippie movement spoke of a spiritual hunger that a lot of these kids had. And once they had exhausted themselves, on the drug, sex, and rock and roll, they started looking to, to more eternal alternatives, which made a lot of them hungry for the gospel and primed for the gospel. And I think we're, we're seeing the same level of excess today and more. So I see no reason why that too can't lead people because here, here's what's happening. I mean, I think the culture is deceptively offering life altering options to people. And many people take those options and realize, oh my gosh, that wasn't it. I had the same realization myself when I had burnt myself out on the excesses of my own sexual experiences and had to question, wait a minute, is this really all there is? What else might there be? Now that kind of a question, that leads people to truth. So I see no reason why the same thing couldn't happen today on a bigger scale. I mean, you know, I don't care what the, what the culture does, Nobody's going to kill the gospel and nobody's right. going to kill the Holy Spirit. Nobody's going to kill the word of God. They can kill the messengers, but not the message. So this stuff still works. When the gospel is preached, people still respond. 
And when people respond and come to Christ, they still can be discipled. It still happens. Yes. Rome couldn't do it. The Soviet Union couldn't do it. China can't even do it. I mean, there. The, when you look at the demographics in China, you're going to end up seeing that the micro minority in China is going to be the communist when the majority is going to become the Christian. And Wonderful. and so I, I I think I see our task for those of us in the pulpit. We've got to give the tools, and I, I think your book is an outstanding part of that equation. I really do. And it needs to be in every Christian's library. It needs to be in every minister's library. That we have got to firm up the body. We need to quit playing hippie church or whatever kind of churches that, that you're calling it today. Uh, guys, I even had when uh, Dr. Marianne Brown was still alive, uh, she she can't, she called me and said, Mike, I was literally at a church and she said they turned on the fog machine and it says, here comes the glory of God. She said, I didn't know it was produced by Frigidaire. <laughs> and so we, we, we have. I learned something new today. Great. We, we have all this ridiculousness going on. All that needs to be set aside. You know, it, 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 it's amazing to me that the Apostle Paul, I mean, he was so limited. He, he didn't have PowerPoint. He didn't have movies that he could show during church. He didn't have audio video stuff that he could do. He simply sat down and taught the word and transformed cities. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think if we return to that, and on the same token, brother, I believe that when this dam or this off-ramp kicks in, those of us in ministry, we better have our ducks in a row because we're going to be running hard and fast. Uh, I've already seen this with a remnant. When when they're awakened, they have the appetite, appetite of a teenage boy that will empty out a refrigerator every single day. Yeah. Hallelujah. Then that means we get to teach for an hour and a half at a time, Mike. Oh, there are there are places when I do seminars. Sometimes I'll teach eight eight to twelve hours a day. And and the, I'm I'm starting to see that hunger again in in America. You know that was normal overseas. You go to Africa, but I'm starting to see it in America again. Hallelujah. And uh, guys, I, I, I Joe, I I think your book is strategic. I think it's I think it's answering a real need. Uh, it is getting us to we you can't you cannot get to the correct answer until you learn to ask the right questions. Yes. And and yeah. your and your book does that. It begins addressing the real systemic problems of what's going on in our culture as well as in the church that has gotten our immune system so low that uh, we were having a hard time fighting this infection. And so that that cure is there. The Holy Spirit is is waiting to in, empower your books, and I know there's going to be a lot of other ones that other ministers of the gospel across the body are going to raise up to write to address these things. And on the end, we're going to come out stronger than when we went in. I think we will, Michael. I think that people are, as you said, still very hungry for the Word of God. And I think that we are more than ever seeing the need for people to give the full counsel of God. We are wanting to preach the gospel so people will come to life. And once they have come to life, we want to disciple them. And one of uh, one of the uh, aspects of Paul's own credentials, he said, was the fact that he, uh, when he talked to the Ephesian elders, said, I haven't shunned to give you the full counsel of God. And I think this is where we're going to need to revisit the idea that the word of God is precious. We cannot, whatever else might happen, it cannot be as consequential as what we would face if we compromise the word of God. If we compromise our own stewardship as ministers of the word of God. And I think that when we get back to that, that recognition that when people get the full counsel of God based on the word of God, it is transformative. It bears eternal fruit in the lives of the people. Then I think we develop more of that, that sort of attitude that says, well, then whatever happens, nobody is gonna stop me from doing that. And, uh, and I think that that's when we fear the consequences of God's displeasure more than the displeasure of the culture. Ironically, that's when we really reach the culture. Oh, yes. uh, I think there needs to be a transition. Um, we have gotten so mega church driven I don't care how many seats you fill. What I care about is the hearts that you have filled because it is transforming 
the minds and the hearts of those that attend. It's yeah. not, and, and we, we have forgotten that. Yes. Uh, we, we've turned it into a social club instead of an equipping station. It needs to be a training ground for the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. I, th- I think it, uh, in fact, Dr. Mary, she was probably one of the most prophetic women. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she held the highest rank in the, in the Southern Baptist that you can have as a woman. And then she got spirit filled. Probably one of the oh. most prophetic women I've ever known my entire life. And back in the early 2000s, she called me and she said, Mike, the church is getting ready to go through something. And when it's done, the church will not look anything like it does today, but it will be filled with power. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, I, I think we can expect some real refining and some real equipping as a result. And, uh, you know, there is a part of me that really hates, I mean, vehemently hates what we're seeing. I really hate a lot of what we're seeing. And there is a part of me that I hope is not masochistic that is also saying, yeah, but bring it on. Yeah. Because I think that the hardship, as much as I personally loathe it, also has a refining influence on the church. I think we're seeing a manifestation. And, and that works both ways. I think we're seeing manifestation of, of evil, of compromise, of lukewarmness, of deception. But I think we're also seeing more of a manifestation of people who are saying, no, I hold to truth by the grace of God. And yes. I think that there is, there is a power in that that is tremendous. So I think that, that uh, I guess it's like Dickens said, you know, best of times, worst of times. Yes, amen. So the refining fire, gentlemen, just let me add this, this comment listening to you. The refining fire of God purifies the faith in what? Brings the power of the Holy Spirit to bear, not just upon our lives, but out of our lives, touching thousands. My prayer is thousands will be touched by the ministries that God is raising up in these last days, all for his glory. Amen. Once again, I want to encourage everybody, Joe's site is www.joedallas.com. And yes. go there, and he, he's, he's a writer, he's a blogger, he does... He has his own YouTube channel uh, and then all his wonderful books. And, and not just this book, but you need to build your library off the books that he has published because there's not a single one of us that uh, this whole concept of sexuality and sexual confusion and all these different things are not touching us in one way or another. Mm-hmm. And we have to be able to exp- to be able to respond in love, in knowledge, and from a biblical worldview. Yes. Amen. Amen. And uh, I want to thank you, Joe, for being on here today. It's, it's just, uh, I feel like we could go for another hour just fellowshipping and talking about the things of the kingdom and what God's getting ready to do. But guys, you know, get get his books and be a part of what God's doing in this hour. Yes. Because God is preparing a church without spot and a wrinkle. And uh, I want to end this almost the way that Joe started it, is that uh, there's a quote from uh, Tertullian that I remember when he was dealing with Uh, the Christians having to resist uh, the Roman Empire and the cultural pressure. And he used the the gladiators. And he says, you know, when you're facing a gladiator, the factor is not how strong and powerful that gladiator you're facing is. How strong are you and how adept at your weapons are you? And I think that every minister and every Christian needs to look in the mirror and ask them, how adept am I in the word of God and using the weapons of my warfare to setting the captives free? Yes. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. All right. Mike, you want to add anything before we, uh, before we close today? No, I just want to thank Joe for taking the time to join us here on the Kingdom War Room. It's, it's always a blessing, brother, to, to chat with you. And so thank you. Thank you. Both of you, thank you. I I, I like your background. I I see an inspiration brother for me for some things. That's nice. (laughs) You can thank my wife for that. Yeah, this is the office where we record my podcast. And uh, so since we happen to be here anyway, we thought we'd dress up for you today. Thank you. (laughs) All right, brothers. God bless. God bless. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. 
Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that store dot biblical dash life dot com